It's all on the line, Tyro. You gotta let go! Cloak and Dagger is finally starting to pick up steam, so let's break down Season 1, Episode 5, right here on What Happened. <laughs> What's going on, you lovely people? Lisa here, and I am so excited because after a pretty slow start, Marvel's Cloak and Dagger is really getting into its groove, and I am so excited to see how the rest of this season plays out. So this week's episode is called Princeton Offense and finds Tandy kind of having a new lease on life after her suicide attempt, and now she's really determined to get justice for her dad. Meanwhile, Tyrone's powers start going out of control and he can't figure out why, and it happens, of course, at the worst time possible, during the state championship basketball game. Plus, he reunites with someone from his past. And we also have O'Reilly finally getting the storyline and she's ready to get down and dirty if that's what it takes to take down Connors. Plus, we also meet Ali Maki's character, Mina Hess, so let's just break it all down. Now, if you remember a few episodes back, we overheard Tyrone's mom on the phone setting up some kind of commercial shoot or something for Roxxon. And she wanted all these people to be very like empathetic and things like that, kind of normal-ish people who could really sell that Roxxon is helping them. Well, we start off the episode with a bit from that commercial as we have a man saying how he's teaming up with Roxxon to take on the world and sharing his story and you know wanting to make the world a better place. This is actually a bit of a commercial that we see Tandy watching as she continues to work through the paperwork and sort out what she took from Greg's office about the Roxxon case. She then decides she needs access to a computer and a printer so instead of going to the library where does she go for help? She shows up at St. Sebastian's prep and surprises the crap out of Tyrone. Tandy shows him that ever since her suicide attempt she's actually been able to you know have a clear head and she can actually control her power something she's kind of proud of and something he still isn't able to do now for anyone that watches Riverdale like you know I do there's a funny little Betty and Veronica reference to the Archie comics Tandy then asks Tyrone if she can use their computer lab so they head off to the lab where she pulls up the rocks on core website and she starts printing out bios for a bunch of like b-level corporate people and she explains a little bit more about this case to Tyrone and how you know there's a bunch of men but there's some missing pieces and she's trying to figure that out. She really gets Tyrone's attention though when she says she wants to use the powers they have and maybe, you know, she can use them on these guys to figure out how they're linked to this case. Of course, Tyrone thinks this would be like a violation of, you know, someone's privacy, but Tandy's ready to steal back some of the world that was stolen from her. Tyrone then heads off to his pep rally before the big state championship game and Tandy watches from afar and then she has this light bulb goes off. She's at a school full of rich kids and they're all in this courtyard at this pep rally. Yeah. So she uses her handy little light dagger to break into some lockers, stealing looks like some iPads and whatnot, and she also decides to steal a school uniform. She then goes back to the church and puts the bios in the places for the missing spots, but there's still one big spot missing. So she continues her digging and finds out that there's this big rocks on golf event that night, and there's often a lot of like fancy girls, and by fancy girls I mean like high-end escorts at this place, so Tandy gets an idea here. Tandy uses her newly acquired school uniform and her talent for lying to end up getting a job with that escort company or whatever it actually is and she ends up at the party that night. She then heads to the party looking all fancy and uses her powers to look into the hopes of all those guys whose bios she printed out and she sees that they really all have one thing in common. There's one man that all these guys are using to serve them in various ways if you get what I'm saying. One guy even has this dude duct taped to the wall as like a piece of art and stuff. So basically it seems like all of these guys want to turn the tables around on this one guy, this boss guy, whoever this is. Meanwhile, Tyrone, like I said, is gearing up for his state championship game and he also thinks he needs to make things official with Evita because, you know, she kind of calls him a friend earlier in this episode, so maybe he's thinking he's getting friend zone, which is not a good feeling. When he returns home after school, he looks at a picture of Billy and Billy's two friends on the wall and takes it off the wall and starts reminiscing with his mom about Billy and, you know, he's like, I'm gonna play for him and she's like Billy would be proud of you and all this kind of stuff. Tyrone gets curious then and asks whatever happened to Billy's two friends and his mom can only remember you know that one of them did well for himself after they moved away. Now when Tyrone goes to put the picture back on the wall he's all of a sudden teleported and ends up in some kind of warehouse or workshop. We learn this place belongs to Wayne one of Billy's friends from the picture. Now you think Wayne would be more shocked to see Tyrone just magically appear in his warehouse after many a years but he's just kind of 
of actually kind of calm, a little bit surprised, but not really. He's just like, I haven't seen you in forever. You must have known I was thinking about you. They start to reminisce, and then we learn that Wayne has built a business rebuilding houses and stuff like that. But Tyrone is pretty observant and notices this really fancy watch on Wayne's wrist. Then before the game, when Tyrone is in Father Delgado's office, Abita finds him and Tyrone decides he's going to make things official by giving her his Letterman jacket. Something I thought that we still didn't do to this day. I thought that was something from like Happy Days or Saved by the Bell, but I guess it still happens, possibly. They're now going steady, and Tyrone tries to explain, you know, you know, sometimes he gets weird and quiet and whatever, but, and it's not actually all bad when he does that. And Evita just says that she knows and she pays attention to him. Yeah, that's kind of not creepy, right? Although, I guess it's good to be an observant girlfriend. As the game starts and continues to go on, there seems to be one ref calling things in favor of Tyrone and St. Sebastian's, including, you know, calling fouls where the other kid didn't even touch Tyrone, and when Tyrone misses a complete pass without even touching the ball, yeah, they call it in favor of St. Sebastian. So Tyrone's like, what the heck is going on here? When the referee touches Tyrone, Tyrone sees the referee's fears and it looks like the ref has maybe been paid to rig this game or someone's gonna die if something happens with this game. Oh, and the basketball that was in Tyrone's hands at the moment when the ref touches him disappears and drops into the middle of the rocks on party in front of Tandy. And it's a kind of a sign that someone's gonna end up where they don't want to be. During halftime, Tyrone goes into the locker room trying to figure out what the heck is going on with his hands and everything. So he sits down, puts a towel on his face to try to like, you know, get zen and calm down. But ta-da, he ends up teleporting to that Roxxon party right in front of Tandy. Tyrone thinks that all of this is happening because Tandy is recklessly using her powers and it's making his own powers go haywire since they are linked together. He tries to ask Tandy to stop doing whatever she's doing, but Tandy is kind of like, you know what? She's really close to figuring out who this mystery dude is and she, she just can't stop until she figures it out. Thankfully though, it's not going to take a long time for that to happen because she turns around and sees this picture on a wall and realizes that the guy in the picture is Peter. Peter Scarborough, and that's the guy from All the Visions. And Tyrone's like, that guy looks familiar to me too, and he says that's the guy who was leading the charge against Tandy's dad in All Those Visions from a few episodes ago. Tandy also remembers that Peter is the guy who led the charge when Roxxon stormed into their house and took all of her dad's files and stuff after his death. So now Tandy knows who she's got to look for, and Tyrone's like, okay girl, if I don't get back to the state championship game, these boys are gonna beat my ass worse than they beat me up in the locker room a few episodes ago. The only thing though is Tyrone doesn't know how to control his powers and how to get back in a snap. So Tandy's like, I got a solution for this. Have you tried that whole dying thing yet? Yeah, it worked for her in the last episode, but Tyrone's not too sure about this whole thing. Tandy decides he just needs a, a little a little push to uh, get there. And by a little push, I mean a literal actual push. She pushes him off of the second story or wherever they are. And he falls and it looks like he's going to meet his demise in some kind of fountain. But the thing works and Tyrone wakes up in the locker room all wet and just in time to go start the second half of the game. The game goes on and St. Sebastian's is now one point down with only seconds left in the game. And Tyrone has the ball. Now he can either shoot it and be the hero, or will he miss it? Well, as he starts charging towards the hoop, he begins to see the opposing team members' fears as they touch him as they try to like get the ball from Tyrone and stuff. And he realizes that these guys have it really tough. Like their lives are not all glitz and glamour and you know pretty like the people that most people probably that can afford to go to St. Sebastian's prep. They could really use this win. So when Tyrone has that last second shot, he takes the shot and ends up missing. And honestly, afterwards, he gives this little smile and smirk. So yeah, it's kind of like he threw this game in favor of the people who needed this win more for, you know, themselves and for their community. Now, I'm not sure his teammates will like that, but hopefully they're dumb enough to think Tyrone just took an actual shot and just missed it for real. Like, he didn't miss it on purpose to try to throw the game. Now, when Tyrone goes home, though, he's still a winner because Avita has crawled through his window and is sitting there in his Letterman jacket with every little teenage boy's fan- well, not every little teenage boy's fantasy, but a lot of teenage boy's fantasy. Uh, underneath that Letterman's jacket is nothing but her underwear. So yeah, Tyrone gets lucky and is a winner after all in a different way. Evita also tells Tyrone that she knows what he did for the ref and the other team and reiterates that she knows him, that she's observed him, and she knows who he is. Now this kind of feels a little confusing. It's like, does she actually know, you know, about his powers? She's picked up on that kind of stuff? Or does she just say she knows who he is because she knows kind of like who he is under this tough facade that he's put on and that he's actually like a really good person with a good heart or, or whatever it is. Like, 
Is it about the powers? Is it not about the powers? Because I'm thinking Tyrone thinks that she knows about the powers, but she's just like, I don't know about your powers. I just know who you are in the sense of that way. I guess we'll have to wait and see. But as far as Tandy goes after the party, she goes back to the church and researches Peter and sees that he's actually the name on a bunch of these documents that he's signed. So she hatches one of her plans and she goes to Peter's house and knocks on his door. And of course, she's in her little schoolgirl uniform, acting all innocent like her tire blew out and she needs to borrow a phone. Peter decides to come outside and chats Tandy up and fixes the tire for her and Tandy is about to you know like she wants to kill this dude because she has a light dagger in her hand but she stops herself and instead puts her hand on Peter's neck and sees a vision of Peter in a lake emptying money from a bunch of traps into his cooler. Then dead bodies of workers start floating to the surface and he starts emptying the money from them as well. It's like this dude's been collecting these checks from these so-called dead guys. One body is actually still alive and starts going after Peter, but Peter ends up killing him and that guy's hard hat floats over to Tandy and on it, it says Ivan Hess. Now Tandy returns to the church and looks up all the files again and on the back of the plans for the rig, I think it is, or it has her dad's name signed to it and underneath his name is Ivan Hess. So it feels like her dad worked very closely with this Ivan guy. Now this name actually rings a bell because earlier in the night at the Roxxon party, a young woman named Mina Hess was getting ready to speak on stage and Tandy mistook this girl for being some girl who was drunk out of her mind and just needed help, but Mina said she actually just had stage fright. So Tandy ends up looking up an article about Mina and reading up on her. Tandy then shows up at another shoot for the Roxxon commercial and sees Mina filming a scene much like the opening scene of this episode, saying how Roxxon, you know, helped her dad and pay for all her dad's medical bills after his accident and put her through school and all of this and how she's ready to work with Roxxon to change the world. But there's something when this girl looks at the camera and says these last bit of words, like, oh, like she has this vendetta in her eyes. Like she's trying to take down this place maybe from the inside because it seems like she knows something else. Like this does not seem like a, I love Roxxon, they helped me. This is like when you have to grit your teeth and like say something nice about your like when you're growing up and your brother who was picking on you and you're like I love my brother it's like that kind of a thing right also in this episode we do get some more of detective O'Reilly who is a dirty cop but not in the sense of like Connor stealing drugs dirty at least just yet more like she's just okay having sex in the back of some cop's car during duty time yeah she ends up getting a call and returning to the station. We see her actually talking to Tyrone about his stolen bike. But of course, we all know Tyrone is there to talk about something else. And so they kind of talk about this whole stuff on the DL with when it comes to, you know, Vice Connors and trying to see if they can get him for Billy's murder and all of this. O'Reilly says it's not going to be easy to get Vice Connor. She's going to see what she can do. She then starts looking up articles about Billy and then the Vice Cops and some Agent M or something. I don't know. There's a lot of articles on the screen in this episode. Her booty call cop then comes over to check on her and she starts asking him about the drug traffic and the 12th Ward being down and how it seems like someone took out all the local dealers and what's up with that? Is there, and there's like maybe one main dealer now. I don't know, all of this whole case and the drug stuff is really starting to pique O'Reilly's interest. It's mainly because she sees that Connor's name is basically the intel source on a lot of these, these past cases that got rid of all those extra drug dealers. O'Reilly then goes to get some more intel by seeing Liam, who still hasn't made bail because, as he says, he donated all his cash to an unworthy cause. Ouch, right? But yeah, Tandy kind of deserves that. She did him dirty and this poor guy's just sitting in jail. I'm guessing he's gonna get out though because he gives O'Reilly the information she wants, which is that she wants to know about the drug scene at the old club Liam used to frequent. O'Reilly is then able to snag one of the girls who is the house coke supplier at the club. This girl says she doesn't know who the magic man in charge is, but that she meets with a runner the same time every day, and that's really all the information she can give O'Reilly. So O'Reilly takes the girl's drugs and lets her go. We then see O'Reilly in her little office or trailer or whatever snorting some coke, and it's like, whoa, is she actually a dirty cop too? Like, dirty like Connors who walks in Connor then walks in and he's kind of actually shocked too and he's like you know what you you're not who I thought you were and she asks if he wants to join her so he sits down and starts partaking and uh, and the two start sharing stories and talking and kind of actually bonding O'Reilly's earning this dude's trust and being like yeah I'm, I can play like your game with you but she's basically putting on an act to make Connor think that she could play his side at some point and Connor's is buying it saying that maybe they should do a ride together sometime and O'Reilly leaves the place just smiling. I'm kind of hoping that she snorted some fake coke that she wouldn't go that far to get the information she needs or to get, you know, whatever she needs for Connors. But 
I guess sometimes you gotta do whatever you gotta do, right? Connors though seemed very intrigued by O'Reilly, was buying her whole act, and now seems very interested in where she got that really good coke. Going back to Tyrone, we see him after Evita has left, put a towel back on his head, and he's teleported back into a warehouse, and he sees Connors there talking to someone and getting scolded for his last delivery being late, and arguing about not working for the other guy, but being more like his partner. We then see that the guy that Connors is arguing with is Wayne, and Wayne brings up to Connors how he shot his boy. So yeah, we now know that Wayne got that fantasy watch from uh, drug money, and it's kind of like also is Connors helping Wayne in a way to make amends for shooting Billy. All this definitely will put Tyrone in a tough spot because if he's going to bring down Connors, he'll now end up having to bring down Wayne too, and I feel like that's going to bring up questions of loyalty and Billy and all of this kind of stuff. But like I said, I actually really liked this episode. I liked seeing Tandy not so down in the dumps and now on a mission and you know, even though she's being reckless with her powers, she has this new outlook on life which I'm excited to see play out. And it seems like Tyrone is thinking differently as well because he realized that these other kids needed the win more than his team so instead of you know being like, I could make my life better by winning this game for this team, he gave it to the people who really needed it. Anyway, I'm excited to see where the characters go from here, so let's watch the promo for the next episode. The present is daunting. We never step in the same river twice. You think some kind of disaster is coming? I do. And we talk about a point of no return. There's always a point of no return, darling. It's called the end. All right, looks like Avita's aunt is back and Tyrone might be making some pretty dumb decisions when it comes to going after Connors. Like he sh really should listen to O'Reilly and just try to stay alive and be a kid. We also have Tandy getting an internship at Roxxon, so I'm guessing we'll get to see a lot more of Mina Hess. But that wraps up this week's episode of Cloak and Dagger. What do you think of our story arcs for Tandy, Tyrone, and O'Reilly so far? Which character's story arc are you actually more excited to see play out? Sound off down in the comments below and then click right over here for some of my recent interviews. Uh, hit that thumbs up if you like what you see, subscribe, and I'll be back here next week talking about Cloak and Dagger. Thanks for hanging out. See you next time.